The Antichrist by Friedrich Nietzsche, sections 27 through 42. Christianity sprang from a soil so corrupt that on it everything natural, every natural value, every reality was opposed by the deepest instincts of the ruling class. It grew up as a sort of war to the death upon reality, and as such it has never been surpassed. The holy people who had adopted priestly values and priestly names for all things, and who, with a terrible logical consistency, had rejected everything of the earth as unholy, worldly, sinful, this people put its instinct into a final formula that was logical to the point of self-annihilation. As Christianity, it actually denied even the last form of reality, the holy people, the chosen people, Jewish reality itself. The phenomenon is of the first order of importance. The small insurrectionary movement, which took the name of Jesus of Nazareth, is simply the Jewish instinct redivivus. In other words, it is the priestly instinct come to such a pass that it can no longer endure the priest as a fact. It is the discovery of a state of existence even more fantastic than any before it, of a vision of life even more unreal than that necessary to an ecclesiastical organization. Christianity actually denies the church. I am unable to determine what was the target of the insurrection said to have been led, whether rightly or wrongly, by Jesus, if it was not the Jewish church, church being here used in exactly the same sense that the word has today. It was an insurrection against the good and just, against the prophets of Israel, against the whole hierarchy of society, not against corruption, but against caste, privilege, order, formalism. It was unbelief in superior men, and they flung at everything that priests and theologians stood for. But the hierarchy that was called into question, if only for an instant, by this movement was the structure of piles which, above everything, was necessary to the safety of the Jewish people in the midst of the waters. It represented their last possibility of survival. It was the final residuum of their independent political existence. An attack upon it was an attack upon the most profound national instinct, the most powerful national will to live, that has ever appeared on earth. This saintly anarchist who aroused the people of the abyss, the outcasts and sinners, the chandala of Judaism, to rise in revolt against the established order of things, and in language which, if the Gospels are to be credited, would get him sent to Siberia today, this man was certainly a political criminal, at least in so far as it was possible to be one in so absurdly unpolitical a community. This is what brought him to the cross. The proof thereof is to be found in the inscription that was put upon the cross. He died for his own sins. There is not the slightest ground for believing, no matter how often it is asserted, that he died for the sins of others. Section 28. As to whether he himself was conscious of this contradiction, whether, in fact, this was the only contradiction he was cognizant of, that is quite another question. Here, for the first time, I touch upon the problem of the psychology of the Savior. I confess, to begin with, that there are very few books which offer me harder reading than the Gospels. My difficulties are quite different from those which enabled the learned curiosity of the German mind to achieve one of its most unforgettable triumphs. It is a long while since I, like all other young scholars, enjoyed with all the sapient laboriousness of a fastidious philologist the work of the incomparable Strauss. Translator's Note 5 David Friedrich Strauss, 1808-1874, author of Das Leben Jesu, 1835-36, a very famous work in its day. Nietzsche here refers to it. End of note. At that time I was twenty years old. Now I am too serious for that sort of thing. What do I care for the contradictions of tradition? How can anyone call pious legends traditions? The histories of saints present the most dubious variety of literature in existence. To examine them by the scientific method, in the entire absence of corroborative documents, seems to me to condemn the whole inquiry from the start. It is simply learned idling. Section 29. What concerns me is the psychological type of the Savior. This type might be depicted in the Gospels in however mutilated a form, and however much overladen with extraneous characters, that is, in spite of the Gospels, just as the figure of Francis of Assisi shows itself in his legends in spite of his legends. It is not a question of mere truthful evidence as to what he did, what he said, and how he actually died. The question is whether his type is still conceivable, whether it has been handed down to us. All the attempts that I know of to read the history of a soul in the Gospels seem to me to reveal only a lamentable psychological levity. M. Renan, that mountebank and psychologicus, has contributed the two most unseemly notions to this business of explaining the type of Jesus, the notion of the genius and that of the hero, Heros. But if there is anything essentially unevangelical, it is surely the concept of the hero. 
What the Gospels make instinctive is precisely the reverse of all heroic struggle, of all taste for conflict. The very incapacity for resistance is here converted into something moral. Resist not evil, the most profound sentence in the Gospels, perhaps the true key to them, to wit the blessedness of peace, of gentleness, the inability to be an enemy. What is the meaning of glad tidings? The true life, the life eternal, has been found. It is not merely promised, it is here, it is in you, it is the life that lies in love, free from all retreats and exclusions, from all keeping of distances. Every one is the child of God. Jesus claims nothing for himself alone. As the child of God, each man is the equal of every other man. Imagine making Jesus a hero. And what a tremendous misunderstanding appears in the word genius. Our whole conception of the spiritual, the whole conception of our civilization, could have had no meaning in the world that Jesus lived in. In the strict sense of the physiologist, a quite different word ought to be used here. We all know that there is a morbid sensibility of the tactile nerves which causes those suffering from it to recoil from every touch, and from every effort to grasp a solid object. Brought to its logical conclusion, such a physiological habitus becomes an instinctive hatred of all reality, a flight into the intangible, into the incomprehensible, a distaste for all formulae, for all conceptions of time and space, for everything established, customs, institutions, the church, a feeling of being at home in a world in which no sort of reality survives, a merely inner world, a true world, an eternal world, the kingdom of God is within you. Section 30. The instinctive hatred of reality, the consequence of an extreme susceptibility to pain and irritation, so great that merely to be touched becomes unendurable, for every sensation is too profound. The instinctive exclusion of all aversion, all hostility, all bounds and distances in feeling, the consequence of an extreme susceptibility to pain and irritation, so great that it senses all resistance, all compulsion to resistance, as unbearable anguish, that is to say, as harmful, as prohibited by the instinct of self-preservation, and regards blessedness, joy, as possible only when it is no longer necessary to offer resistance to anybody or anything, however evil or dangerous, love as the only, as the ultimate possibility of life. These are the two physiological realities upon and out of which the doctrine of salvation has sprung. I call them a sublime superdevelopment of hedonism upon a thoroughly unsalubrious soil. What stands most closely related to them, though with a large admixture of Greek vitality and nerve force, is Epicureanism, the theory of salvation of paganism. Epicurus was a typical decadent. I was the first to recognize him. The fear of pain, even of infinitely slight pain, the end of this can be nothing save a religion of love. Section 31. I have already given my answer to the problem. The prerequisite to it is the assumption that the type of the Savior has reached us only in a greatly distorted form. This distortion is very probable. There are many reasons why a type of that sort should not be handed down in a pure form, complete and free of additions. The milieu in which this strange figure moved must have left marks upon him, and more must have been imprinted by the history, the destiny, of the early Christian communities. The latter, indeed, must have embellished the type retrospectively, with characters which can be understood only as serving the purposes of war and of propaganda. That strange and sickly world into which the Gospels lead us, a world apparently out of a Russian novel, in which the scum of society, nervous maladies, and childish idiocy keep a tryst, must, in any case, have coarsened the type. The first disciples, in particular, must have been forced to translate an existence visible only in symbols and incomprehensibilities into their own crudity, in order to understand it at all. In their sight, the type could take on reality only after it had been recast in a familiar mold. The prophet, the messiah, the future judge, the teacher of morals, the worker of wonders, John the Baptist, all these merely presented chances to misunderstand it. Finally, let us not underrate the proprium of all great and especially all sectarian veneration. It tends to erase from the venerated objects all of its original traits and idiosyncrasies, often so painfully strange it does not even see them. It is greatly to be regretted that no Dostoevsky lived in the neighborhood of this most interesting decadent. I mean someone who would have felt the poignant charm of such a compound of the sublime, the morbid, and the childish. In the last analysis, the type, as a type of the decadence, may actually have been peculiarly complex and contradictory. Such a possibility is not to be lost sight of. Nevertheless, the probabilities seem to be against it, for in that case tradition would have been particularly accurate and objective, whereas we have reasons for assuming the contrary. Meanwhile, there is a contradiction between the peaceful preacher of the mount, the seashore and the fields, who appears like a new Buddha on a soil very unlike India's, and the aggressive fanatic, the mortal enemy of theologians and ecclesiastics, who stands glorified by Renan's malice as le grand maître en ironie. 
I myself haven't any doubt that the greater part of this venom, and no less of esprit, got itself into the concept of the master only as a result of the excited nature of Christian propaganda. We all know the unscrupulousness of sectarians when they set out to turn their leader into an apologia for themselves. When the early Christians had need of an adroit, contentious, pugnacious, and maliciously subtle theologian to tackle other theologians, they created a god that met that need. Just as they put into his mouth, without hesitation, certain ideas that were necessary to them, but that were utterly at odds with the Gospels, the Second Coming, the Last Judgment, all sorts of expectations and promises current at the time. Section 32 I can only repeat that I set myself against all efforts to intrude the fanatic into the figure of the Savior. The very word, imperio, used by Renan, is alone enough to annul the type. What the glad tidings tell us is simply that there are no more contradictions. The kingdom of heaven belongs to children. The faith that is voiced here is no more an embattled faith. It is at hand. It has been from the beginning. It is a sort of recrudescent childishness of the spirit. The physiologists, at all events, are familiar with such a delayed and incomplete puberty in the living organism, the result of degeneration. A faith of this sort is not furious, it does not denounce, it does not defend itself, it does not come with the sword, it does not realize how it will one day set man against man, it does not manifest itself either by miracles or by rewards and promises, or by scriptures. It is itself, first and last, its own miracle, its own reward, its own promise, its own kingdom of God. This faith does not formulate itself, it simply lives and so guards itself against formulae. To be sure, the accident of environment, of educational background, gives prominence to concepts of a certain sort. In primitive Christianity, one finds only concepts of a Judeo-Semitic character. That of eating and drinking at the Last Supper belongs to this category, an idea which, like everything else Jewish, has been badly mauled by the Church. But let us be careful not to see in all this anything more than symbolical language, semantics, and opportunity to speak in parables. Translator's Note 6 the word semiotic is in the text, but it is probable that semantic is what Nietzsche had in mind. End of note 6. It is only on the theory that no work is to be taken literally that this anti-realist is able to speak at all. Set down among Hindus, he would have made use of the concepts of Sankhya, translator's note 7, one of the six great systems of Hindu philosophy. End note 7. And among Chinese, he would have employed those of Lao Tse. Translator's note 8. The reputed founder of Taoism. End of note 8. And in neither case would it have made any difference to him. With a little freedom in the use of words, one might actually call Jesus a, quote, free spirit, unquote. Translator's note 9. Nietzsche's name for one accepting his own philosophy. End of note 9. He cares nothing for what is established. The word killeth. Translator's note 10. That is, the strict letter of the law, the chief target of Jesus' early preaching. End of note 10. Whatever is established killeth. The idea of life as an experience, as he alone conceives it, stands opposed to his mind to every sort of word, formula, law, belief, and dogma. He speaks only of inner things, life, or truth, or light, is his word for the innermost. In his sight, everything else, the whole of reality, all nature, even language, has significance only as sign, as allegory. Here it is of paramount importance to be led into no error by the temptations lying in Christian, or rather ecclesiastical prejudices. Such a symbolism par excellence stands outside all religion, all notions of worship, all history, all natural science, all worldly experience, all knowledge, all politics, all psychology, all books, all art. His wisdom is precisely a pure ignorance. Translator's note 11. A reference to the pure ignorance, Rainy Thorheit, of Parsifal. End of note 11 of all such things. He has never heard of culture. He doesn't have to make war on it. He doesn't even deny it. The same thing may be said of the state, of the whole bourgeoisie social order, of labor, of war. He has no ground for denying the world, for he knows nothing of the ecclesiastical concept of the world. Denial is precisely the thing that is impossible to him. In the same way, he lacks argumentative capacity, and has no belief that an article of faith, a truth, may be established by proofs. His proofs are inner lights, subjective sensations of happiness and self-approval, simple proofs of power. Such a doctrine cannot contradict. It doesn't know that other doctrines exist, or can exist, and is wholly incapable of imagining anything opposed to it. If anything of the sort is ever encountered, it laments the blindness with sincere sympathy, for it alone has light, but it does not offer objections. Section 33. 
In the whole psychology of the Gospels, the concepts of guilt and punishment are lacking, and so is that of reward. Sin, which means anything that puts a distance between God and man, is abolished. This is precisely the glad tidings. Eternal bliss is not merely promised, nor is it bound up with conditions. It is conceived as the only reality. What remains consists merely of signs useful in speaking of it. The results of such a point of view project themselves into a new way of life, the special evangelical way of life. It is not a belief that marks off the Christian. He is distinguished by a different mode of action. He acts differently. He offers no resistance, either by word or in his heart, to those who stand against him. He draws no distinction between strangers and countrymen, Jews and Gentiles. Neighbor, of course, means fellow believer, Jew. He is angry with no one and despises no one. He neither appeals to the courts of justice nor heeds their mandates. Swear not at all. Translators note 12, Matthew verse 34, end of note 12. He never, under any circumstances, divorces his wife, even when he has proofs of her infidelity. And under all of this is one principle. All of it arises from one instinct. The life of the Savior was simply a carrying out of this way of life, and so was his death. He no longer needed any formula or ritual in his relations with God, not even prayer. He had rejected the whole of the Jewish doctrine of repentance and atonement. He knew that it was only by a way of life that one could feel oneself divine, blessed, evangelical, a child of God. Not by repentance, not by prayer and forgiveness, is the way to God. Only the gospel way leads to God. It is itself God. What the Gospels abolished was the Judaism in the concepts of sin, forgiveness of sin, faith, salvation through faith. The whole ecclesiastical dogma of the Jews was denied by the glad tidings. The deep instinct which prompts the Christian how to live so that he will feel he is in heaven and is immortal, despite many reasons for feeling that he is not in heaven, this is the only psychological reality in salvation, a new way of life, not a new faith. Section 34 if I understand anything at all about this great symbolist, it is this, that he regarded only subjective realities as realities, as truths, that he saw everything else, everything natural, temporal, spatial, and historical, merely as signs, as materials for parables. The concept of the Son of God does not connote a concrete person in history, an isolated and definite individual, but an eternal fact, a psychological symbol set free from the concept of time. The same thing is true, and in the highest sense, of the God of this typical symbolist, of the kingdom of God, and of the sonship of God. Nothing could be more unchristian than the crude ecclesiastical notions of God as a person, of a kingdom of God that is to come, of a kingdom of heaven beyond, and of a son of God as the second person in the Trinity. All this, if I may be forgiven the phrase, is like thrusting one's fist into the eye, and what an eye, of the Gospels, a disrespect for symbols amounting to world historical cynicism. But it is nevertheless obvious enough what is meant by the symbols father and son, not, of course, to everyone. The word son expresses entrance into the feeling that there is a general transformation of all things, beatitude, and father expresses that feeling itself, the sensation of eternity and of perfection. I am ashamed to remind you of what the Church has made of the symbolism. Has it not set an Amphitryon story? Translators note 13. Amphitryon was the son of Alcaeus, king of Tyrans. His wife was Alcmene. During his absence she was visited by Zeus and bore Heracles. End of note 13. At the threshold of the Christian faith, and a dogma of immaculate conception for good measure, and thereby it has robbed conception of its immaculate